Amen. So brothers and sisters, I have the privilege of reading to you three portions of Scripture this morning. You can find them noted up on the screen. It'll be a portion of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Book of James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. And 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. And I ask that you please stand for the reading of God's Word. Therefore, as a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, waiting patiently for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's day is coming. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged, the judge standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. And love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy and it does not boast, and it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, and it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices in the truth. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. May God bless the reading of His Word to your soul. You may be seated. Amen. Awesome. Continuing looking at how to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord for the glory of God alone. And um, our um, anchor text has been Ephesians 4, uh, 1 through 6. And then we are looking at other verses as it relates to that. Last week we saw that children of God walk with patience, I mean with gentleness, Tonight, today, we're going to look at children of God, walk with patience. Lord Jesus, we just thank you and praise you for uh, bringing us together this morning to worship you. We thank you, Lord, um, that all the fruit of the Spirit and all these uh, characteristics of uh, children of God uh, walking in a manner worthy of you are, are possible for us uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through submission to your control through um, being filled with your spirit. So we just praise you and thank you for um, this in Jesus' name. 
Amen and amen. So, Paul says, God's word says in Ephesians 4, 1, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. And we saw that that walk includes walking with humility, gentleness, and uh, today, with patience. Um, and we've seen how that word implore means I beseech you. It's a summons. Like when you're summons to a courtroom. I beg you, I plead you, I implore you, walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have received. Is there a, there's an intensity here. A strong desire expressed here. Uh, and it's Paul is saying, in light of how you've been called by God, in light of Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, in light of you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in light of you were chosen before the foundation of the world, in light of, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, in light of everything that, so please, if you haven't yet, make sure you read Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, in light of everything, in the, in the way, the manner in which you've been called, and how you've been called, walk in a manner worthy of that calling. Children of God, walk with patience. Walk with patience. And we've seen as we've been going through these uh, series of messages that obviously the Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest example of any one of these. Hip Hebrews chapter 12, 1 through 4 says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, with reference to Hebrews 11 and the Hall of Fame of Faith, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And certainly, to run with endurance, we need humility, we need gentleness, we need patience, we need love, we need the fruit of the Spirit. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, this is how you run the race, this is how you walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Here we have an example of what he's done for us. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross. You think about it, remember now the calling with which you've received from God. How you've been called, how your eyes were open. Right? Every single person here who's saved, every single person who's listening to this, who's saved, truly, genuinely saved, the Lord had to open their eyes. They may have heard the gospel for 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, 5 years, 2 years, 1 year. God had to open their eyes. And even this morning there's some that the veil is still over their eyes and over their hearts. Likely there's some sitting here. Most likely there's some possibly watching this. And until the Lord opened their eyes and opened their heart, they will not be saved. And you think of the, the patience of Jesus for the joy set before him. He endured that cross. Children of God, I implore you, walk with patience. Remember your calling. He endured, suffered, was patient, and dying for your sins and my sins. Despising the shame, he sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 3 says, thinking about the example of Jesus and patience here, for consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. That's a good verse right there for the, in the midst of the whatever it is that we deal with. You think about your Lord, consider him. You know, we have trouble, and we're going to look at the verses here in James in a minute about suffering and about patience. And, and, and the main reference there with patience in the James passage is patient with difficult people, patient with those that are giving us a hard time, okay, which happens in life. You think about how our Lord endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Remember the calling with which you've been called. Remember how he has saved you, what he's done, and how he got you to the point, or how he got to the point where he offered himself as a sacrifice for the sins of those who would believe in him. So he, so that you don't grow weary and lose heart when you're suffering hostility or difficulty from people. And I have to include verse 4. You've not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. I like that verse. Think about what he strove, what he suffered, 
what he endured in his struggle and his battle against sin, our sin, so that we would be forgiven, the wrath that he bore for us. Remember the calling with which you've been called. Remember him in the garden. Remember the calling with which you've been called. Please remember him in the garden, in Luke, and in the other passages, where it says, you know, stay here, wait with me, watch with me, pray, help, you know, pray with me, he's saying to the disciples, and he's sweating, and Luke says, great, it was like, it is a condition that, it's a condition that happens. It's a medical condition. It's like the sweat turned to blood. So that you would be saved. And so that I would be saved. And even in our fight against sin, we've not resisted to the point of shedding blood in our shedding blood. That's a great admonition for us in fighting sin, fighting impatience, fighting lack of humility, fighting pride, fighting not being gentle, fighting whatever it is that we're struggling with. I, I wonder if we took a poll this morning and we said, okay, so far we've looked at um, humility, gentleness, and today patience. And next week, you know, in a couple weeks maybe, if we keep going with this passage, we'll finish these few verses, I'll showing tolerance to people in love, maintaining the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Now, I wonder, I guess it would depend on what's going on that day, which one we struggle with the most. Right? Some of us, you know, we have besetting sins and those that we struggle with more than others. And God uses those to change and transform us and to sanctify us. So he says, children of God, walk with humility. Remember Jesus' example, and we've read 1 Peter 2, 20 through 23 again. Let me read it in his example of his patience and what he endured and the calling with which you were saved out of what he has, through what he has done. For you've been called for this purpose, Peter says, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. And every time I read those verses and hear those verses and think about those verses, we can think to ourselves, how do we respond when we're reviled? How do we respond when somebody, whatever, comes at us in whatever way that they do? How do we respond? Do we respond with humility, gentleness, patience, love? And, and again, there's times when we don't. And I keep saying throughout these messages that we're learning together. We're learning Christ. Ephesians 4 says we're learning how to follow Christ. So we encourage each other. So we confess. So we repent. So we move, continue to move forward. We think about the Lord's examples. And he didn't revile in return. While he was suffering, he uttered no threats. How did he do this? He kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. So we'll go to James chapter 4. Children of God, the, 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 the summons here this morning. Children of God, walk with patience. And then we got the example from James in the scripture of the farmer. I suppose if you're impatient, if you're an impatient person, there's no way you could ever be a farmer, right? <laughs> James chapter 4, verse 7 says... Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. Be patient. Patience, patient, the word patient comes from a compound word in the original meaning long temper, long tempered, or long suffering. Some translations say long suffering. And as I said earlier, this verse in the context here and the word patience that's used there in the original refers to being patient while bearing the offenses of others. To exhibit internal and external control in difficult circumstances. That would require being gentle. That will require being meek. Meekness is power under control. Okay? And are you encouraged? Please be encouraged. Right here it says, therefore, be patient. James says, be patient. 
Paul says, children of God, walk with patience, a summons. Therefore, be patient, brethren. I always take notice, as I said to you, I always try to take notice when it says brethren or beloved. Sometimes when I write you a text or send you an email, I put a lot of times brethren, beloved bride of Christ. These are exhortations and encouragement to the brethren, to those who are saved, to those who belong to God, to those who have received Christ, to those who have received the calling of God, they've turned to Christ in repentance and faith to be saved. They're seeking to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, and we don't always do that. So, therefore, be patient, brethren. So that's an encouragement to us, right? Be patient, brethren. Be patient, beloved, fellow believers. So why is his address to the brethren so significant, important, and encouraging? Because it, it recognizes the fact, we recognize the fact that we can be impatient, and we are impatient, and we are not gentle, and we are not humble at times, and all the different things that we deal with. But we have the Lord, we have the Spirit, we have the Word of God, we have the fellowship of the church, we have one another, we have prayer, we have disciple, many means of grace by which to help us grow as children of God. And look, I don't I have to say this is this is another part of this. If you struggle with impatient, if you're not a patient person, or you're not gentle, or you're not humble, and forget all of us, pride is the beginning of it all, right? Pride is the root of it all. But those very areas in which you and I struggle, somebody maybe you're dealing, I mean, we all deal with all different stuff of life. Somebody, we could be dealing with something right now and we are really struggling. I, when is this going to end? I'm not. Lord, I'm very impatient here. Help me. And what I'm saying is, and you know this already, that the very areas in which we struggle, God uses the circumstances and the situations of those events of life to develop that character trait within us, to refine us, to shape us, to mold us, for our good and for his glory. So, we could say, how long, how long, how long, right? When we're in the midst of it and we're dealing with it and, we're, and, and it's, it's a trying situation. On the other side of that, please know that God is working in you and me and in us to mold us, shape us more and more into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. That's what the purpose of it is for. And the Bible talks a lot about that as it relates to suffering in general. Do you see? So he says, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Do you see how long we're called to be patient? <laughs> this will be true. This is true. How long are you called to be impatient, brethren, beloved child of God? I keep walking away. This one's, this isn't working for some reason. No, it's Yeah, it's okay. Um, how long are you called to be patient? How long am I called to be patient? Until the coming of the Lord. Until we go to be with him or he comes back. One or the other, Right? until the coming of the Lord. So this ought to give us great hope, just in the fact of knowing that he is coming back. I was saying to, uh, where was I? I think I was at Woodside, and I was telling the ladies at Woodside this past week that one of two things obviously is going to happen, right? When we say that the Lord, the Lord is either coming back, of course, or we're going to go to be with him. He's either coming back with his return, or we're going to go to be with him. And the Bible says in different, many different verses, the nearness of God is our good. And that's where the nearness of God comes from. We go to be with Him. I look forward to that. You look forward to that. But the nearness of God we experience now is, is now, for all of us impatient people, the nearness of God that we can experience now is right now while we're here on this planet through the power of His Spirit, through the means of grace that He has given to us, we have a relationship with Him, and that way we can experience and enjoy the nearness of God. Like it says in Philippians 4, the nearness of God is our good. So we can be encouraged, children of God, be patient. Children of God, I implore you, I beseech you, God's Word says, be patient. We can be patient in view of the second coming of the Lord, and we can be impatient, we can be patient knowing that He is with us. That's why it is tragedy of tragedy to me to, to, to watch and to see when I do this or when I watch the body of Christ, the beloved brothers and sisters of this church or those associated with the church 
in the midst of the trials and tribulations and difficulties of life, and I've been saying this repeatedly the last few weeks, they go away from the church. A tendency can be, and it is for some, to go away from the fellowship of the church into hiding, sometimes really deep hiding, like a fugitive on the run, like, like um, Jonah. And all and that's just totally opposite of what God calls us, that you always come, come to me, come to the Lord, come to the body of Christ, in the midst of the impatience, in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the whatever, the first place to go is to the Lord, the throne of His grace, the second place to go is to the church, the body, the local body, to the, to, the, to the brothers and sisters here, to the elders, to the leaders here, to, hey, let's go for a cup of coffee, let's, hey, I'm, this is, please, just pray for me, just pray and we can help with that. And we do. We do get opportunities to do that. I was thinking about it today, though, or this morning, even when I was sitting here, I was going, I know, still way too much time. Brother John, would you say the same thing? Amen. You've got way too much time. We, we, could, we could spend even more time helping and encouraging the brother. There's not like, oh, I, we don't have enough time, or, you know... Or the path to our doorway is just so beaten down and well tra traveled that we got no, we can't accommodate anybody else. We got plenty of opportunity and time to do that, and we'll always make time and opportunity to do that. And I say that even now, even with this little little shift of my time schedule and stuff, it's like, let's go, no sweat. When do you want to go? When do you want to meet? We'll make the time when we can and we want to. As part of the body of Christ coming together. Behold, a farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil. And the early rain would, rain would soften the soil. The latter rain would come in the early spring, help the soil to mature to the harvest. And he says in verse 8, he says a couple times just in these four verses, you too, he says again, you too, be patient. So that's like we can say to each other, you too, brother, be patient. You too, remember the coming of the Lord. You too, remember the Lord is near. You too, remember the Lord is gentle and kind. You too, remember that the Lord is with you. You too, remember that in the midst of the trial, the tribulation, the difficulty, the thing that's causing you, that's real, it's real. Situations, circumstances of life are real. And the impatience that we feel is real. But in the midst of that, God is molding, God is shaping, God is directing. And as we come to the fellowship of the body, then we come to the Lord we get a better perspective over what's happening, right? We get a better perspective over what's happening. So we, we, can say, we say to each other in love, in gentleness, you too be patient, right? We need to encourage one another with these words. Is waiting a passive endeavor? Not really. Look at what we're called to do while we are waiting. It says, you too be patient in verse 8. You too, while you're dealing with it, you too be patient. And in, while you're being patient, strengthen your hearts. Again, he says, for the coming of the Lord is near. The word there, uh, strengthen your hearts, uh, refers to, uh, uh, the root meaning is to come to stand and to prop up, strengthen. And we need help propping up one another. Right? It means to endure calmly. And again, the, 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 the real context here is when being mistreated. Maybe somebody's not doing you know, what they're supposed to do in your life. You got family members, you got in-laws, you got outlaws, you got co-workers, you got unsafe children. I didn't mean to make light of that. I just the thought just goes into my mind. You got unsafe children. We have unsafe children. And many of you can give testimonies of what mistreatment even happened at the hands of unsaved children in your life. Whether they're your own or somebody else's that you're taking care of. Mistreatment that comes, right? Or maybe as a grandmother or a grandfather or whatever. Strengthen your hearts. You need encouragement. It refers to how we bear up under the trials. Jesus urges those who feel like they're about to uh, collapse under the weight of persecution to prop themselves up. Strengthen your hearts. 
with the hope of Christ's return. Strengthen your hearts with the promise of Christ's imminent presence being with you now in the midst of the trial tribulation situation that's causing the impatience that you are impatient in. And you see it again, church, this is a community project. We need to strengthen and encourage one another to endure and to pers persevere in the faith. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, can't say it any clearer. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, that's like saying, remember that you're calling, remember the calling with which you've been called. Remember how you've been able to enter into the presence of Jesus by the blood of him, by a new and living way. That's remember your calling. Remember your calling, church. Remember your first love, church. Remember your calling. He inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And since we have such a great priest over the house of God, what do we do? Verse 22 says, what do we do? Because we've had this great high priest over the house of God, because he's inaugurated for us a way to enter into his presence through the blood of Jesus, what do we do, children of God? What do we do, born again, professing born again believers? What do we do? We do what 22, 23, 24, 25 says. We do what's the normal thing for the child of God. We do what verses 22, 23, 24, 25 give evidence that the person is a child of God. Is if you're not, if we're not walking, if we're walking perpetually or habitually outside of 22, 23, and 24, 25, I'm talking habitually outside of this. That's a cause. That's a bummer. That's a cause for concern. Here's what it says: We do. We draw near. Let us draw near with a sincere heart. In full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast, a community project though, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Community project. And let us consider how to stimulate one another on to love and good deeds. Community project. Community effort. We need one another, not forsaking our own assembling, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day coming near. Children of God walk with patience, and so we encourage the brethren, we encourage one another walk with patience, we encourage each other come to the body. Come to the church. Come to the local body. Come to the leaders, the elders of the church that can help. Come to them. And the child of God, when they hear that, they're like, well, I may be over here in the weeds. Yeah, I may have drifted. I may have struggled, and I am struggling, and it's real. And we understand that, and we appreciate that. But when they call goes out to the one who's the Lord's, they come to Christ. They don't continue to stay away. They just, they just don't. The coming, of a, the coming of the Lord is at hand, he says. It means near. It means the day of the Lord is coming. It's close to approach. The, Lord, the return of the Lord, we know, could come at any moment. James 5, 9 says, in light of this Children of God walk with patience. Here, verse 9 tells us, we know when we're not walking with impatience. We know we're walking not with patience, but with impatience when we're in verse 9. And any one of us, at any moment, can fall into verse 9. When the struggles of life come and there's it's impatience, it's like, okay, I don't want, I want this anymore. I want this. This needs to end. I need this to stop. I need this to go away. And be careful, brethren, please. I, I say this in love. I know our own, my own sinful heart. We can fall into this even within the church. Instead of... It's just a fine line between going for help to our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we need to do that, and then just being careful that this doesn't call, fall into a complaining 
party or a pity party. He says, Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. So, the original complain means to groan within oneself, to sigh. It's like what the Israelites did, right, in Numbers chapter 14, and they did repeatedly in the wilderness, uh, complaining and grumbling against God, and we're, we're called not to complain and grumble. And when we complain and grumble, when I complain and grumble, and when you complain and grumble, when we complain and grumble, grumble we are demonstrating our impatience over a situation. So right then, the, the warning light goes on. My kids, uh, recently, we've rediscovered watching Lost in Space. And when the, dead, when the robot said, there's only one person here who relates to this, so go ahead, just say it. Danger, danger. Okay. okay. The robot will go, danger, danger, danger. We knew that danger was coming. And so when we know when danger is coming and we know when the propensity is toward the flesh, we would want to stop. We would want to ask the Lord to help us to move in an opposite direction. Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 15 says, Do all things. You ever try to you ever try to do like good things? Like sometimes there's good things that we do or we're trying to do or some way trying to minister, some way trying to live something out, some way trying to be an example, some way trying to help others. And it says, do all things without grumbling and complaining. Right? I find myself sometimes even, or you might find yourself too sometimes, sometimes you're trying to do good things and you're grumbling and complaining about it. And it's like the Lord's like, really? To me, he's looking like, really? Do all things without grumbling or complaining. Help us, Lord. Children of God, walk with patience. Help us, Lord, to walk with patience. Help us, Lord, to learn Christ. So that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God, above reproach in a warped and crooked world, in a warped and crooked generation. And then he says in verse 9 of Ephesians, or James 5, Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. And verse 10 and 11 says, uh, I'll read 10 and 11 in a minute. Let me just, Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. Those who do not know the Lord, those who have not turned to Christ in repentance and faith to be saved, they face this is, this, is right, this is right outside their door. This final judgment here in condemnation apart from God is standing right outside their door. They don't know the day or the hour. And so I plead as I plead. My brother John, he's up there, pleads too. If there's any light, any inclination toward the Lord, any impulse, any nerve, any urge, any something in your heart, that's saying, this is true, I need Jesus. This is true, I need to turn to him. Please do so right now, right now, today. Because each time you hear that call, and you reject, the heart gets harder, the heart gets harder, the heart gets harder. And the Bible even says, there's a point in here, it says where there, there's no repentance. It's, I met one on, the, on his deathbed. Would we just totally, would we totally refuse totally refused. The judge is standing outside of the door. This is the result of the eternal damnation that can occur to the, what will occur for the unbeliever. As an example, brethren of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Verse 11 says, and we know about Job, we're going to read about him in a minute. We count those blessed who have endured. Hebrews 11 has that list. You've heard of the endurance of Job, and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealing with him. So please remember, brethren, this, this last phrase here in verse 11. In the midst of impatience, in the midst of struggles, in the midst of whatever it is that we're dealing with as the children of God, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. That's why we say two weeks in a row, we say, merciful Savior, merciful Savior. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. 
All right, so with the remaining time here, a little bit of time here, how can we walk with patience? We're implored, we're called, we're told, we're, it's a summons, we're beseeched to walk with patience. What are the ways that we can walk in patience? What are the opportunities we have to walk in patience? What does walking with patience look like? And, and probably this is the first one right here. We walk with patience. When do we walk with patience? How do we walk with patience? How to? How to do it in the midst of life, in the midst of people, situations, circumstances? How do I walk with patience? How do I walk with patience when being persecuted? How do you walk with patience when being persecuted? How do you walk with patience when something in your life is just not quite adding up and there's a trial, there's a difficulty? We walk with patience when we trust in God's sovereignty over all things. What's the verse that we love to quote as it relates to the sovereignty of God in all things? Probably the hallmark verse, maybe a believer trusting in the sovereignty of God. It's Romans 8, 28. Start with verse 27. So easy to read off the page. Such a challenge while we're learning Christ and dealing with the world, the flesh, and the devil. I'll start with 26. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things together to work together for good to those who love God, to those who have been called according to his purpose. It's a hallmark verse. It, it, it's one that we would all struggle with in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the trouble, in the midst of the difficulty. And, you know, uh, someone could come alongside and in love and in the right way and in the right manner say, well, you have to, you have to be a wise counselor. But the, the principle is that God is working all things together for good. And sometimes we're in the midst of it, like if you want to be honest and admit it, sometimes we're in the midst of it, we're like, yeah, I know, I believe that, but I, 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 yeah, I know he's working it together for good. And Okay, yeah, he's molding me and shaping me into his image and likeness, and he's changing and transforming me, and I know I do, I get it, I get it. But I wake up tomorrow morning and I got the same thing still going on, and I'm still dealing with it, right? The truth is we're still going to deal with it one way or the other, but it's better to deal with it knowing that he is sovereign and he's in control he's in control over it than if it's just happening and it's just wow why hasn't this guy done this I mean I've heard in devil situations like like simple things like I don't know simple things of life that someone needs to do to correct a situation and it's like it's like it gets all bollocks up and they don't file the paper or do the whatever. I don't know. Think of situations that you've dealt with and, that, and you just you do. You want it to be resolved, but please keep in mind that I mean, God is over it and He's allowing it and He has His hand on the, what's that phrase go? He's got His hand on the I don't know, hand on the thermometer. It's like He's in control of what's happening. Job 1 21 says this. This is the deep end of the pool stuff, brothers and sisters. That's not what this said, it's what I said. He says, He said, Naked I came forth from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I can't imagine that guy writing that him, whatever. How he wrote that hymn. It is well with my soul. And the story of that you've heard is, is like his whole family, he lost his whole family in, a, in, in an instance. In an instant. And Job suffered the same way. Help us, Lord, as we need to walk with patience. Help us, Lord, to 
trust in the sovereignty of God over all things. Please help us to do that. And a patient person is learning to say, Lord, if this is what you planned for me, not my will, but your will be done. So, how do we walk with patience? Well, you can challenge right now. You can walk with patience while you are suffering. In the midst of the suffering, Romans 5, 1 through 5 says, Therefore we've been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exalt in the hope of God, in the hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also... Exalt in our tribulations. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character. And proven character, hope. And hope is not disappointing. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit, whom He has given to us. And James, speaking of James, in chapter 1, to four, and Paul gives examples of this as well. Again, it's real. We accept it. We understand. Life has got different seasons to it. There's times that are more difficult. There's times when, you know, we got brothers and sisters in Christ who are saying, how did I get here? Why am I... My whole life has been changed. Why am I living in this better king? Why am I living in this convalescent home? Why, why, why am I here? What, what's going on? Sometimes I have to say it's the, it's the difficulties, the trials and tribulations of life, so I have to say and then to say it's the, it's the fallen man, the fallen condition of man. There's, there's age, there's bodies deteriorating, we, we're getting old, we're, 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 we're dying. Right? And the body breaks down. And this is what God, what happens sometimes. He says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. And, and there's just no way that we can even begin to do that until the next verse kicks in quick. But the testing of your faith produces endurance. That's the purpose of it. And let its endurance have its perfect result. So that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in Nothing. So there's a challenge for us while we're walking in the midst of suffering. Lord, help us to walk with patience. How do we do that again? We can walk with patience when we remember that suffering is temporary and that the Lord is coming back. I was saying that, you know, Tuesday or whatever day it was this week, I think it was Wednesday, with the ladies at Woodside. It's like the suffering, yes, we, we get it. But it's temporary. And there's that verse in the Bible. Let me read 2 Corinthians. It's, it's chapter 4, I think. Hold on. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is the truth of it. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though our outward man is decaying, yet the inner man is being renewed day by day. Now this next verse is either true or it's not because it's God's word. It's true, right? It's truth. It says, For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all of comparison. It's like, well, we're in this earthbound life and we're dealing with the suffering, we're dealing with the pain, and the, it feels like it's just so heavy. And, but God's word is saying, in light of eternity, and the Lord's return and 50, 60, 70, 80 years on this earth and depending on how many years of it is suffering could be 60 years of your life, 70 years of your life, 80 years of your life, 10 years of your life, 5 years of your life, 5 minutes of your life, 12 months of your life and it feels, it really does, it's, it's, it's excruciatingly painful, but he says, in light of the glory to be revealed, it's like you put the weight of the glory that's to be revealed forever, eternity, not ending time, forever 
and forever and forever and forever and forever and forever with the Lord in His kingdom, in His, with his, in his glory. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more suffering, no more sin. No more flesh, no more world, no more devil to deal with. He says it's like weight in comparison when you compare it to that. However, the weight of the suffering for the unbeliever who's experienced the grace of God in this life and the grace of God has been extended to them even now, even today, with the sunlight and the sunshine, whatever means of blessings that they have, they got their internet, they got their computer, they got, you know, their... Someone's, they got food, so people, you know, there's provisions for them in this, that they have in this life. All that is one thing well, compared to the eternal suffering and coming to the one that has not professed Christ. The weight of that goes like off the chart. Pain, suffering, darkness, despair, outer darkness, fire, it says eternal separation from God, no hope of parole, no hope of get out of jail free, maybe a remembrance of uh, February 19, 2023, and somebody's up there preaching the gospel to them and imploring them and calling them to come to Christ to be saved, and they're sitting there and they're like, I remember that moment, and I said no for the hundredth time. And now I'm in agony in these flames, and there's no hope. And that's where there is no hope. So in the midst of suffering, help us to remember that Christ is going to return. Help us to remember that uh, the Lord is coming back. Help us remember that He's either coming back or we're going to be with Him. Okay. Um, we walk with patience when our relationships are defined by love. That's how we do it. How to love is patient is the first one it says in 1 Corinthians 13 4, 13, uh, 4. love is patient Lord but I'm impatient and I'm impatient in my relationship Lord love is patient help me Lord to be patient help me Lord to get to the root of what my impatience is am I getting something that I want to get in this situation and in this manner right now I confess that. I repent of that. Help me, Lord, to go to your word. Help me to seek godly counsel. Help me to deal with my impatience, Lord. It says love is patient. And then it's followed up with love is kind. And love is gentle. And all the things that it says that love is there in 1 Corinthians 13. And help us to remember that Jesus is patient. And Jesus is kind. And Jesus is gentle. And all the things categorized there are listed in 1 Corinthians 13. Jesus is, and Jesus was, and is toward us in our impatience, and un, in our ungentle, in our not being gentle, in our being in kind. All of that. Patience endures difficult people, it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14-14. 14-15. How do we walk with patience? How do we demonstrate it? We walk with patience. I've got a couple more and we'll be done. Now, walk with patience when we don't sin with our lips. <laughs> That's how you know you're walking with patience because as soon as you're not walking with patience, then there you go. And there's the words that are said. In James chapter 3 is the one about taming the tongue, right? And verses 5-7 through seven say, for every species of beast and birds of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue, while well, the Lord can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. You ever wonder why, why, why with it we bless our Lord and Father and with it we curse men who have been made in the image and likeness of God. And you want to see the epitome of patience? A great how-to book is James, right? I've said that before. James chapter 1, verse 19. This takes patience, right? What I'm about to say, what God's Word is about to say, takes great patience. We've read this verse before in the context of being gentle. This you know, my beloved brethren. This you know, child of God. This you know, have been chosen by God, called by God. This you know, brethren. But everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak. That takes patience. 
slow, long suffering to anger, slow to anger. That takes patience. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. And you know, slow to anger and being patient. And that's why they said, the Bible says, you know, who's the most patient? People say, who's the most patient person that ever lived? And you need the patience of Job. Anybody ever tell, you know you're an impatient person when someone told you at least once in your life, you need the patience of Job. I don't know who that's been told to. So it's been told to you as it's been told probably to me. But I want to read James on Job 2.10. This is, this is not sinning with your lips. With his wife, you know the story, but his wife, she's saying, curse God and die, and all this stuff happened to you, and curse God and die, and uh, bless him, he didn't hearken to the voice of his wife here in this instance. There's times when we really need to hearken to the voice of our wife, which is giving you godly counsel and wisdom. Hearken to the voice of your wife in those situations. There's other times when we shouldn't, He said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept diversity? Imagine if this was on your tombstone. I always listen, hear these verses and think of what's going to be on my tombstone. What's someone going to put on my tombstone? Could they ever put this on mine? And all this, Job did not sin with his lips. All this, Job did not sin with his lips. All right, last one. Unsaved person, one last time, one last call, one last plea. Don't mock God. Don't mock God or neglect the patience of God that's being extended to you, even right now, even today, even over the last however many years you walked on this planet. The, the, the patience of God being extended to you and calling you to be saved. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Don't think lightly, not yet believer, of the riches of His kindness and His tolerance and His patience not knowing that the kindness of God was the purpose of the kindness of God, was the purpose of the grace of God that's being extended to you, that's being offered to you, that you've seen, that you've experienced, that, that is being poured out on you. What's the purpose of the kindness of God on your life? It's to lead you to repentance, it says here. And why won't you repent, even now, even today? Why still have you not repented? If you haven't, you could turn that around right now. But it says, because of your stubbornness and unrepented heart, that's why you haven't repented, stubbornness and unrepented heart. And what's happening, it says, you're storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath in revelation of the righteous judgment of God. The judge stands right at the door, I said there in James. Turn to Christ today, right now, before it's too late. Children of God, walk with patience. We're implored, we're besieged, we're summoned to walk with patience. In what ways, think about them as we're closed here, in what ways is God calling you to walk with Him in repentance, in patience today? Could be a relationship, could be with your spouse, could be with your unsaved children, could be with your saved children, could be with your co-workers, could be in school, could be in relationships. In the midst of difficulty, how is God calling you and me in repentance to walk with repent, to walk with patience? And Matthew Henry, in the quote for the week, says, Consider him who waits for a crop of corn, like, like the farmer, and will not wait for a crown of glory. And James says, Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The Lord waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. We thank you, Lord, for the uh, summons to patience this morning. And we thank you, Lord, for uh, the opportunity to walk with patience. Help us in our struggles, where we struggle, to walk with patience. Help us, Lord, to take advantage of the means of the grace that's extended to us to help us in walking with patience through the fellowship of the church, through the word of God, through prayer, 
Help us, Lord, to take advantage of those things. And, Lord, either sitting here or watching, if there is someone that has not yet turned to the Lord and the patience of God and His kindness is just being poured out on them, Lord, I pray, we pray, that if they hear anything, even the slightest inclination toward the things of the Lord, that today, right now, they will come up forward here and answer, and answer to the prayer that we've been pleading that somebody would be saved and that someone would fall down underneath the cross of Jesus Christ right now in repentance and faith and cry out to you and be saved. That would be it. That would be all they would have to do. We pray that that, that would be the demonstration that the Lord has saved this person. Or will they stubbornly walk away again in the unrepentance of their heart? Will they walk away and have that wrath continually be stored up upon them while the judge stands right at the door? Lord, please, please, may it not be so. Give them the grace to turn right now, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.